Oh no, it's mother. She's coming at me. Oh no, I hope she doesn't stab me. Um, I don't know, I couldn't think of a funny intro. Anyway, how's it going? Today we're talking about the Psycho films. Wee, wee, wee. wee. This is the Arrow video set. It, uh, stunning set. I decided to watch all four movies that they have. If you hear snoring and grunting and weird noises, it's just my dog. She's scared of lightning. It's a thunderstorm right now. Exceptional time for me to be filming. Um, <laughs> anyway, to calm and relax, talk about the Psycho films. This will include the 1998 version as well, the remake, because I have since ordered that from Scream Factory. And uh, I don't know when that will come in, but I will be adding it to this video eventually. So I'll probably have a, some here back by that stage. Yeah, I want to talk about these films. I don't know, because Psycho's an elusive horror film. It's an absolute classic. It's one of the best horror films of all time, and I think it's kind of okay. Um, the Psycho films are a very interesting franchise. I, again, have yet to say anything about the 98 film, but I'm very interested to watch that as an experiment of recreating a masterpiece, which, of course, has been done since in terms of other people recreating things for our title, basic premise alone, that kind of jazz, and not always working out uh, for the better. Most of the time it's just been pretty awful, but I'm very interested to watch what it is and to see what it's like. So I'm going to be open-minded, knowing that it's basically an experiment of a movie. But for now, let's talk about the original four. I viewed them on their 4Ks from our video of the exception being the fourth one, Still being a 4K, but I watched the original TV aspect ratio cut, not the preferred widescreen version, because I looked into it and I realized they've just taken the black bars on the side and just squeezed out the image. So I'm like, oh, wow, they've just, like, cut off so much information. I mean, like, it might not be necessary, but I'm like, it's made for TV. Unless you're going to shoot it with, like, the wide ras uh, aspect ratio, which they didn't because, again, TV in 1990 zero, uh, was... Uh, 4x3. So that's the movie in 4x3, and I think it actually looks glorious. The 4K transfers do look immaculate, of course. The first film in particular being the uh, 4K that was already released from Universal. Arrow was just able to basically grab the license to just put it on their own disc and um, add literally nothing else. They couldn't add special features or anything. It's kind of hilarious how it's just that. But that's okay, because I sold off my 4K steelbook, and which was a faulty edition, didn't come with like the mono audio. So, the mono audio, but that's okay, because now I have the, with the mono audio, and of course we'll talk about Psycho, that one, it's the first one, uh, I gave it 4 out of 5 stars, for me it's a film that, it can't be a masterpiece, except for maybe on first watch, because I've seen this film 3 times now, uh, I watched it a few years back, I watched it when I was younger, with my parents, because of course, you gotta watch Psycho, so my parents introduced me to Psycho, and it's a scary film, sure. Um, I love the black and white. It looks incredible. The first half of the movie... Oh, yeah, spoilers, I guess, involved for all of these. So if you haven't seen the Psycho films, go watch them. They're pretty good. Um, surprisingly good series of films. At least three of them are really good. Uh, so far, one of them is just kind of okay. Uh, but it's noteworthy to know that I... Kind of in the, in the mindset of I don't care much for the second half of Psycho. I love the first half. It the way it's shot, the directing, the music, the audio, every the performances. Oh my god! And with that original stereo mix, it is insanely good. It's just everything with Janet Lee, all the way up until she gets killed. Not exactly when she gets killed, but just after she gets killed. Um, until she gets dumped in the water, basically. You know, it's. Fantastic. I adore it. That, for me, is like a masterpiece of like 45 minutes. But then, oh, coincidentally, it's hailing again. Oh, my God. Uh, I can hear it on the roof. Um, <laughs> it was hailing yesterday as well while I was watching Psycho 3 and 4, and that was interesting for the ambiance, to say the least, because it rains a lot in these movies. Um, it got to a stage where you get to the second half, and unless you're really convinced, or if you've never seen it before, then sure, you know, it's all new information, but on rewatch, I'm watching it thinking, yeah, but I know it's Norman that's the killer, you know, it, there's no real shock value there, I don't really care much for the extra characters that have been introduced, including her boyfriend and her sister, so, as in Marion Crane's boyfriend and sister, I don't care much for them, it's weird, because it's like, 
I feel like if they had a bit more to set up their loss for me to be really empathetic towards them, then maybe, sure. But because the first half of the film is this solid thriller, and then it's suddenly, oh, we're going to kill off the main character in the first half of the movie, which is fine. It still works. It's iconic. It's a classic thing to do. And it makes it more of a Norman Bates film for the second half, which is still really good because Anthony Perkins shines in this movie. He is spectacular as Norman Bates. I just don't care for the other characters that much, you know? It's not as interesting to me to be like, oh, did 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 Norman know that she was going to run away with the money? All this bullshit, and then, of course, you find out that he's actually a murderer. Or is it him, or is it mother? Ah, crazy kooky. But still, I gave it four stars. It is tremendous. It's a iconic film for being, obviously, the start of the slasher genre. Um, it It's Hitchcock... It's really well directed, it's really well acted. Like, everything about it is fantastic to me. It's probably more of a four and a half star film, but because the second half just drags so much to me, because I just don't care. I don't care about these protagonists that we're left with, you know? They haven't been set up that much. In fact, the sister wasn't set up at all. She just shows up, like, you know, because the boyfriend is at work and he's like, and they, the police and her find him and they're like, hey, we think that she ran off with you. And he's like, what are you talking about? She hasn't. She was meant to come by a couple of days ago and she hasn't shown up. Oh, lo and behold. So, you know, it obviously leads them to finding the, ma the Bates Motel, discovering that she was there under an alias, and that they think that she either ran off or something else happened to her, and they discover, of course, that Norman Bates is in fact a murderer. He's doing this psycho thing where he just stabs people. It's great. Um, him and the wig is great. The reveal of the dead mother. It's still a good reveal. Like, I... If, I don't know if my partner has seen any of these films. Well, she hasn't seen the sequels, at least. I don't know if she knows the twist, that it's, you know, that Norman... Not exactly that Marion Crane dies, but the fact that Norman Bates is the killer, that it's actually him dressed up as his mother, who's been dead for many, many years now. Like, I imagine if I showed it to her, she'd be shocked by that. Be like, oh my god, that's insane. You know, what a twist, you know? Stunning stuff. But I imagine she probably knows through, like pop culture, you know, uh, osmosis, you know, that just naturally you would know that Norman Bates is the killer in the Psycho movies, you know, or at least I'd probably show it to her and she'd be like, but isn't Norman the killer? I'd be like, no, it's his mother. He keeps saying that. He keeps saying mother's got the blood on her and all that stuff. It was mother. Either way, it's a great film. I just don't love it that much. It's not my favorite of Hitchcock's. It's one that I like watching every once in a while. I honestly could be happy just watching the all the way until just after Marion dies and she's buried in the lake. And I'm like, there, movie's done. I don't need the rest of this. But if I want a good Norman Bates film, I start from when she shows up at the hotel. At the motel. Um, is it the Bates Motel or Bates Hotel? It's a motel because it's, it's a drive-in. I always forget that motel means you drive in with your cars. So, yeah, that was a discovery when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think... If you want to, for me personally, on rewatch, I imagine I'll still just watch the first film just from the get-go because of how good the first half is. But it's like, if I want the Norman Bates story, I just start when she gets to the motel and then I can watch the rest of the sequels as well. And it works really well. You get his character, he kills a girl, bada-bing, bada-boom. It's revealed that it was him. He goes to the jail, or does he? Dun-dun-dun. Psycho 2, another four-star movie. Uh, I really like this. I think it's, as a, as a story about Norman Bates, I prefer it. And as a sequel, I think it is arguably a better film than the original, mostly because it's solid throughout. It's slower in the first half, but then when it gets to the second half, it goes insane. It goes full slasher mode. It's all about... Oh, Norman's 22 years later, he's been released from the psychiatric ward because they're convinced that he's not a serial killer anymore, whatever, he doesn't have mother in his head, because he went to the psych ward. He didn't go to prison, they thought they put him under the claws of insanity. And lo and behold, guess who's there? That's right, it's Marion Crane's sister to say, no, I've got a petition signed with 740-odd people saying that he should stay in prison. And the courts are like, go away. So, off Norman goes, back to the motel. And 
uh, yeah, it's not a perfect situation for him. He has to work at a diner. There's another guy running the motel and he's making it cheap and sleazy. So he's getting a lot of bang for his buck, including selling drugs and all the, all the stuff that Marvel would disapprove of. And it's, it's interesting. It, it starts off slow. You're wondering, is Norman going to be a killer again? Is he just going to snap back into those instincts now that he's back at the house? And it doesn't. It's instead a tragic story. It's unfolding. It's allowing you to understand him as a person, like him dissociated from mother, what kind of a person that he is. And it is thrilling to watch because it's like he's... Perkins is fantastic in the role. Like, honestly, talking about born to play a role, he is tremendous. But even the side characters as well. See, now I've got to whip out my phone because I need to need to credit uh, some of those terrific actors but yes, Psycho 2, which of course is actually directed by Richard Franklin, who, did he do other films? Uh, he did do other films, none that I have seen. Uh, he did the original Patrick, interesting. Um, he's an Australian guy, actually. But yeah, he did the original Patrick, I have that on Blu-ray. But it's uh, Vera Miles, who's Lila Loomis, which is so funny that she's Loomis, not Crane. Why is that? I don't know, I never really picked up. I, oh, it's her married name. Yeah... Yeah, if I'm not wrong, Vera Miles, if I look at Psycho 1... Yeah, she's Lila Crane in the first film, but she's she's got a different surname in the second one. Loomis. Maybe that's a reference to Halloween? I don't know. But yeah, directed by an Aussie, um, which is always a fun thing to know about. Uh, it's actually written by Tom Holland, which is really cool because he did my favourite vampire film with Fright Night, so that's really nice. I might as well just read my review now so you can get more of an impression of what I was thinking. Whilst being a fun pun, Psycho 2 is a character study on Norman Bates, as well as an exploration of redemption, if such a thing can be permitted. It's filled with a slowly building, creepy atmosphere, nice reflections on the original film, as well as great additions to both the characters and the style of the kills. This one's proper 80s slasher, blood and gore up the wazoo, it's beautiful. It's also shot by D Dean Cundy, so it looks great. A bit too bright, I think? I don't know, the HDR grading was just a bit too bright for me, but I mean, I guess you're contrasting with the original Psycho, which is in black and white, but at the same time, it still looks really, really good, really good transfer. Despite opening with the iconic Janet Lee death from the original before transitioning into colour with the Bates house nicely silhouetted and all these different colours pervading through, like as if showing that so much time has now passed through like days and nights and whatever, it's really cool with the colour palette and the way that they do it, because it also introduces, hey, this film's in colour. It's not saying, oh, we, uh, we invented colour in the past 20 years. No, colour was already around. It was, a, it was a deliberate choice by Hitchcock to do it in black and white. And the fact that this one is in colour, but of course transfers from a black and white opening of Marion Crane's death, which I guess was mostly because if you hadn't seen the Psycho or it had been a while, hey, let's show the most iconic scene where Norman Bates as mother kills Marion Crane. I don't know, it's pretty good, to be honest. It, it works really well. I, I thought it was kind of cheesy at first, but then I'm like, you know, it actually works. I like this. So it's a film that knows how to play the classic hits, but not recreate them. The kind of sequel you want, where it's like, oh, we'll make nods and allusions to the original, but we're mostly going to make this its own thing and do something different. And I like when they do that, when they're not recreating stuff from the previous film. Cough, Psycho 3, cough, cough. Anyway, was that seven one enough for you? Psycho 2 is about understanding and confronting your fears, and it uses more than just one character from the original to do so. Even the twists are better than you'd expect, as the original's only real twist was that Norman was the killer. In this film you get a great selection of whodunits in the more modern 80s slasher style. You also get more insanely pulled off kills, though nothing will ever be as iconic as the original film, which of course this film knows that. and acknowledges it immediately and then is like okay all the rest of our kills are going to be completely different we're not going to recreate the stairs we're not going to recreate the shower that's been done we're doing something new and it's going to be insane and i really like how they did the kills one kill in particular a knife going through someone's mouth oh my god i was shocked when i saw it like there's actually a good jump scare in the movie that involves the hand coming out of a door um that actually made me jump a little but but the rest of it, just because it's, again, it's a psychological thriller, it's, it's building on itself. And to, when you get to that kill, oh my god, it is divine. Uh, I, uh, that kill ranks more above, like, the whole of the second half of Psycho. <laughs> so that's pretty good, for me at least. 
In contrast to the original, I still love the first half in Hitchcock style, and despite how iconic it is and what it did for the slasher genre, I don't really care to watch it too often. Like I said before, I'm happy to turn it off when Janet Lee dies. But Psycho 2 manages to keep things fresh and entertaining throughout. I like its different style, but also its fun callbacks to the original. Even with the similar character beats, camera movements, and even the Hitchcock silhouette. There's a Hitchcock silhouette in it. It's really cute. Like, clearly they're like, we're not, we can't be the original, but we can pay homage to it whilst also just being interesting and different. I like that. It, it just, it's, it's not dissociative of its of its predecessor it's respectful to it paying homage i like that um yeah it's just it's nice you know it feels respectful uh one of the better sequels to the, a classic original that i think should be recognized more overall psycho 2 draws you in with the character drama and redemption of norman before slowly pulling back the curtain on a twisted plot and an even deeper reveal the kills are fun, if few, but definitely fun. It's not over the top, he doesn't kill like 20 different people, it's all good. Uh, and Norman is terrifically portrayed by Perkins once again. The other characters are quite memorable too, with some being welcome additions to the story, and Meg Tilly in particular is really good in the role. I really liked her character. I think I prefer this to the original, mostly because it's a more solid overall film. The first half of Psycho is beautiful and a masterpiece, but again, I don't care for the second half as much. Whereas Psycho 2 at least has a more impressive second half compared to its first. Its first half is about the setups and understanding the character, the exploring the characters and stuff. Before you kind of, I realized what the first twist was before it was happening. I'm thinking, hmm, classic slasher, whodunit style. I wonder who the killer is. And I kind of put two and two together, but then I'm also like, yeah, but they can't go that far. Or could they? And then it's like, there's another reveal later on. And it's like, oh... You know, if all your questions weren't answered in, this, in, in, the, in that reveal, they will be answered in the next one. It's just great. It's like all these top people working together and it works really nicely. Um, yeah, I, I would highly recommend Psycho 2. I would pin it above the first one, but I, I put them both as a dramatically good four stars. Again, if the second half of Psycho worked better for me, that would be a five-star masterpiece. Um, and I would love to rewatch Psycho 2 to see if I praise it more, because I've seen a lot of people I follow give it four to five stars. I don't think anyone's given it five, but they're definitely given at least four and a half. But it didn't weigh on me as much to give it that. But I think as an overall, it's a solid picture. Then, of course, you get Psycho 3 from in 1986, which is directed by Anthony Perkins himself. It's a much shorter film. It's only 93 minutes, whereas the other two are about two hours each. I also get it three stars. I didn't like this one as much. I thought it was okay. It's watchable. It's interesting. Its benefits are the fact that it homages very on the nose to the original, but then does something different. But then everything that's like completely new in the film is just kind of meh. So I guess I gotta dive into it. Despite rounding out the trilogy, Psycho 3 doesn't add much to the character of Norman Bates, nor does it add to the story. I mean, it kind of does vaguely, like, it, it, it does a bit of a resolution. I'm not going to say what the resolution is, just in case you haven't seen the film before, but, you know, it does end with a certifiable ending, whereas the second one is kind of a bit, I wouldn't say open-ended, but I think the opinion of the third film is that the second one ends with Norman back in his position that he was in in the first movie. You've got Marvo, you've got him, he's ready to kill again. And the third one, it takes place right after. It's literally like two weeks later, despite being like three years after production or whatever. And yeah, it's... it's, it's, it's I mean... What can I even say? There's a character called Maureen who's basically just Marion Crane from the first one. Her surnames are literally MC. Her initials are MC. There's a guy called Dwayne who's a very abusive person and uh, not a very likable character. He's okay. He has a very iconic scene where he's like basically doing the duty with this girl and he has like these lights, like lamps just in front of his crotch and he's just like waving them like this and she's like kind of dancing it's very like Twin Peaks-esque very lynching in a way uh <laughs> I'd literally you could show that scene to anyone they'd be like oh that's a David Lynch film and it isn't you think but it isn't crazy I think um, if this film focused more on Norman as a rehabilitated killer so showing that despite what he did at the end of the previous film 
um, that was just for his mental state. You know, now it's two weeks later and someone who, it's it's like we're recreating Psycho. you got the girl who exactly looks like uh, Marion. He's having flashbacks and everything. They actually have flashbacks in the film showing, remember the first one? And it's clearly that he is trying to build a reputable business with the motel. And then she comes along and he's like, I, I'm going overboard again. I got to go kill her because... She's reminds me of my past, something I, tr I, I I ran away from for so long that I was rehabilitated from, and then he goes to kill her, it, like Dresser's mother, she's in room one, all that kind of stuff, exactly the same as the first film, he pulls back the curtain, and I had realised it beforehand, because of how they were shooting it, she was there to kill herself, so she had slit her wrist and was bleeding out in the hot water in the bathtub, and she sees him dressed up as mother, and imagines him as the mother Mary or whatever with her cross and all this kind of stuff. That's the best part of the movie in terms of character and everything because he saves her. And I was thinking, wow, okay, this film's going to go down this whole redemption thing where he's actually going to be a better person. He starts dating the girl. They get along really well. And despite the fact that, you know, she eventually finds out he's a killer and she's like, oh, I can't date you because you're actually a sociopath. But then she's like, actually... I really like you, and I want to see if this works, but that doesn't matter, because um, I will give spoilers for Psycho 3, because I don't really care that much about it as a film. Uh, she does die. <laughs> it's accidentally, but it's very homage to... That's, that's the worst homage to the original, because her whole thing, like, her whole storyline is a homage to Marion Crane. Uh, it even has a part where she's in the hospital, and, you know... She's, like, apologizing for dirty in his bathroom, whatever, because obviously blood and all that. And he's like, that's all right, everyone goes a little mad sometimes. And obviously you're thinking, oh, pff, it's just a reference to the first film. But it's like, no, but that's what he said to Marion Crane. He, he's allowed to do that. <laughs> like, he's allowed to say something that you could commonly say that he already had said to someone else before who looked exactly like this girl. So, yeah... Her, that's the best part. Like, if if the best part of this movie is like in a thirty minute block of her seeing, of him seeing her, her staying at the motel, him saving her, them dating, them breaking up basically, and then her going to be back with him, and she ends up dying. Tragedy. It's a very tragic film in that regard, and it's the best part of the film. It takes the original and looks at it in this newer lens and recontextualizes stuff by bringing it into a hey Norman has grown as a person he's not that person anymore he thought he was going to go back to that killing stage of I'm mother now I'm going to kill and then he didn't he saved the girl and he can be redeemed and have a love life and be a good person it's like oh my god this guy can be a good person no if he starts killing other people <laughs> <laughs> it's so dumb. He kills this one chick. He kills that other girl. He kills that guy. It's just every other part that shows that he's still just a serial killer. It's just so dull. And I don't care for it at all. Because none of it's like the original. It's just, we need a body count. Kill, kill, kill. Blood, blood, blood. None of the kills are as impressive as the first film. And despite Perkins still being pretty decent in the director's chair, like, everyone was pretty convincing in their performances. He's a bit cartoonish. In fact, the whole film... Is a little cartoonish. I even watched a video essay that uh, Alexandra Helen Nicholas had done that was part of the set, where basically in her 11 minutes of talking, she just establishes, oh, the movie is like the first one, but also goofier and does a bit different. And I'm like, yeah, I realized that too. I watched the fucking movie, you know? <laughs> I'm not stupid. But at the same time, you know, maybe you're not in the mindset to realize that that's what it's doing, that tonally it's going for something a bit more up there and cartoonish that it's like, hey, you know, we're not going for a serious slasher, we're going for a bit more of a goofy feel. I mean, there's a whole entire scene where he has to beat a guy to death with a guitar. It's stupid. And then he, he doesn't even kill him, so he has to strangle him, and that doesn't work. So then he has to drown him, and then that doesn't work. Oh my god, there's so much stuff. The third one is interesting as a film, but I think what it was best at with the reflecting on the first film and that kind of stuff is underplayed like it's not I don't think it's as fully realized fully delved into as they could have they could have still ended it with the tragedy you didn't need to have him have a happy ending even the accidental death of the girl which leads him to go to prison is fine you know 
Don't think about that in continuity of the next film. Don't worry about that. It's not important. <laughs> but basically, of course, you know, they obviously find the bodies and they're like, oh, well, we got to arrest this guy because he's killed this girl. And, you know, there's this reporter who's been on his ass the whole time trying to understand if he can still be a good person. Can he be redeemed after having killing people? And, of course, she discovers that, yeah, he has still been killing people. So, yeah, it's just... I don't know. It's a film that works only because the narrative and characters in the second film carried over, like as in like the background characters, the sheriff, the diner, that kind of stuff. Stuff like that carried over, which worked for the world building. Because you could go from the first film to the third film, and they're similar enough that you'd be like, oh, it's just a rip-off. It's exactly what you'd expect Psycho 2 to be, but instead it's actually Psycho 3 that does what you expect Psycho 2 to be, you know? where you expect Psycho 2 to, to be the first one again, just 20 years later, doing it all over again. But then the third one is actually like, no, we're doing that one. But actually, we're going to look at this like constructively and change his character and work on him and improve him. And it works. But then everything else in the film just doesn't. It's all like basic slasher crap. And it's like they, they couldn't think, are we going to have someone else be the killer? Or are we just going to have Norman be the killer? Norman has to be the killer. He's the killer. He has to be the killer. He shouldn't have been the killer. I don't think he should have killed anyone in these two movies. I think the only person he should have killed is the person at the end of the second film, and the joke would have been that he didn't kill anyone else, except for accidentally killing the girl at the end of the third one. That would have been okay. Because again, it's accidental. He didn't mean to do it. In fact, he didn't even really try to. She slipped and fell. But of course, still down the stairs, whatever. The effect, I think, kind of worked better in the third film. It's kind of weird, but still. So... Yeah, it's it's one of those things where I feel like it could have been... It just could have been a better film, in my mind. I still think it's good. I don't like it as much, because I thought it was kind of boring, especially for 90 minutes. But yeah, it's it's a film that could have been improved upon, and it just wasn't. Um, I think if they had have maybe kept his story and developed it a little bit more, but also like his story with Maureen and whatever, developed it a little bit more... But then had maybe Dwayne be a proper, like, actually, he's a serial killer. He already tried to assault Maureen. What if he actually went further with other people? And what if he was at the motel and he was killing people? And he's working there now so he can find, he can hide the bodies easier and that kind of stuff. Like, if that was him doing that, it would work. His character is already set up to be a scumbag. Him being a serial killer on the side, sure. Especially, like, this is the 80s. I was going to say the Charles Manson days, not exactly, but, you know, it, it would make sense. It would work. But they just didn't do that. And instead they're like, now we're going to make it be Norman. He's the killer. I just don't like that choice. I think it, I don't think it works. I think they should have had it been a finalized redemption arc with it ending in tragedy where she, the love interest, dies and he goes back to prison or the insane asylum. In this case, I believe it was an insane asylum because then we get to Psycho 4. The beginning. The beginning is has two different cuts again. They're both exactly the same, just different aspect ratio. I went for the TV cut version. I thought it looked insanely good. Um, for, for like, the first film is iconic, looks amazing. The second film, I really like the look of it. I think it's a bit bright with the HDR, but everything else looks amazing. The third film, it's a bit duller, it's a bit meh. The fourth film, someone had reviewed it, was saying how, oh, because it's a made-for-TV movie, you got to keep in mind that whatever limitations. But then I'm watching it, I'm like, what do you mean? This looks spectacular. This is, like, the almost the best-looking film in the series. Like, I kind of feel like it is. I don't know. It's it's It has some great contrast. It's, a lot of it's just back-and-forth phone conversation between Norman Bates and the, character, and the radio DJ. And you expect it to just be shot, reverse shot, shot, reverse shot. But Norman's walking throughout his whole kitchen. He has to deal with a neighbor at one stage. He has to call up his wife at one stage. And even the radio station, between breaks and stuff, they've got three different people there. They've got two people in the booth, uh, the producers and whatever. One of them, terrifyingly, is John Landis of all goddamn people. That was a real jump scare. I did not expect him to be in the movie. And um, he's kind of weird. Maybe he just really liked the first Psycho film. And when he found out they were making the fourth one, he's like, I want to be in it. So he was. I actually sent my mate Gaia um, a Snapchat being like, oh my god, cameo jump scare, because of course the, the clip that I sent him ended with, um, uh, 
with John Landis showing up. But he was like, what What do you mean, John Landis? Who's that? I see CCH Pounder, and I get scared. I don't know if that was his actual reference, but it's CCH, what a name. I've seen her before in some films. I don't even know which one she's been in. Oh, she's been in Orphan and Avatar and Avatar 2 and Godzilla, man. She's been in a bunch of films that I've seen. Demon Knight, uh, Robocop 3, oh, we. So, she's in it. Um, of course, Anthony Perkins returns as Norman Bates. There's a young Norman Bates, played by Henry Thomas. Yeah, the guy from E.T. and uh, all those Mike Flanagan projects. He's fantastic as Norman Bates. Uh, Olivia Hussey's in it as Norma. I don't really like her that much in the film. I know it's kind of uh, funny that she was in Black Christmas. She's in this. She plays, like, his mother. I don't like her that much in the role. I think the character is still kind of okay. It's obviously you got to really develop Norma as like we've already had this three, two films, three films of mythology uh, showing the effect she had on Norman and then and, and him replicating her voice and whatever. A nice line of dialogue with him saying how he replicates her voice but it can never be as sweet as hers. I do like that because then at least continuity wise when you're watching this film you're like oh well of course that's why she sounds different because it's a different person. But then, of course, the person who did uh, Alice Herson, Herson, who voiced Mother in, I believe, oh, not even all four films. She only did it in the fourth one. <laughs> LaMeo. <laughs> did she only do it in the fourth one? That's Yeah, Virginia Gregg. Was she... She was in the first three. Oh, she died after the third film came out. That's uh, the same year, actually. So, yeah, Virginia Gregg. Great voice for Mother. Fantastic. Honestly, I didn't really notice that there was too much of a difference with Alice Herson as the voice of Mother as well. I still think it worked. I had, I, there was, it sounded a bit different, but not dramatically so that it, it caught me off guard or anything. But yeah, there's also Warren Frost. He's great. He's there. He's Dr. Leo Richmond. He's just... He's a doctor. <laughs> he's in it for half of it and he just leaves. It's so funny. It's like, oh my gosh, that guy. Oh my gosh, that girl. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, John Landis. You know, whoo, jump scares. But still, Psycho for the beginning is the 1990 film released two years prior to Anthony Perkins' death. Um, of course, his last role as Norman Bates. And I think it's a really good finale, despite the whole, oh, it's actually set four years later and we're not really going to mention the fact that he went to back to the psych ward but then was okay four years later. They kind of answer that because he met his wife there. And you're thinking, you say what now? He has a wife? Yeah, he has a wife now. He has a wife. She's pregnant. It's his birthday. He's concerned. The radio has this program about guys who kill their mothers. It's got a whole fancy psychology name that I'm not going to bother to remember. And they're doing a program on that and he calls in. And so... You know, he he basically just uses it as a, I'm going to explain my backstory. They kind of cut it back and forth between him and the present, him as a kid, him as a teenager, cutting in between to see what's relevant as it kind of, like, draws in, like, the center point being his, the death of his mother. And then the stuff of him after his mother's death, the stuff of him before his mother's death, and how they reflect on each other, like, all the stuff that built up to him loving his mother, then him hating his mother or what made him kill her, then what he did after as a teenager, and, you know, what he did with the body, all that kind of stuff. Like, it all works, and I like how they do it. Like, it's a very familiar style of narrative and whatever. Um, but I still liked it. I thought it was really well done. I gave it three and a half stars. The fact that, that it was just a simple story of just Norman explaining his backstory, but at the same time, he's also said to the radio people... I'm thinking of killing again. And they're like, okay, you explain your backstory. We're going to call the cops. So he explains his backstory. They delve into it, understand his psychology, understand why he did it, whatever. And then, of course, comes to the, who are you going to kill? And he reveals his wife, who is a nurse at the mental institute. She fell in love with him at her site. He took a few more sites, according to him, to fall in love with her. He's living in her house. Um, and he's knocked her up. He didn't know that. She's pregnant like a month or two or whatever in, and she was lying about the fact that she... Because he didn't... He considered that it, his insanity is a part of his genes, much like his mother and whatnot, and he didn't want to replicate that. But then she's like, no, 
we can have a kid, it'll be all right, it's about, you know, n you know nature over nurture, whatever, you know, as long as we nurture them, they'll be okay. They won't naturally be a psychopath. But he's scared of that, so of course his immediate response is, I'm going to kill her because she stopped taking the birth control and I don't want to have a kid, you know, and she doesn't want to take have an abortion. So it's like, mm, okay, so is he good, is he bad? It's an interesting dilemma. And the whole first 60 minutes, really solid. The last half an hour is a bit iffy for me, um, mostly because it becomes a... Obviously, you got to wrap up the whole why did he kill his mother stuff, and that stuff is really drawn out. That is... Like, how many times he poisons her and her boyfriend, and ironically, I think this is a continuity error, because they definitely stipulate in the second and the first and second film that he poisoned her for tea, and in the second film you see the can of, you know, tea leaves and whatever that he's got poisoned, so he uses it a second time. But then in the fourth one, it's iced tea, because they make a whole point of like, oh yeah, she uh, hated the, the summer and the heat, so he made iced tea a lot. Clearly it's to sexualize the crap out of Norma, because my god, did they sexualize the crap out of Norma. Like, they, they allude, oh, is this, like, maybe incestuous? And he's like, no, I never wanted to screw my mother. I'm like, are you sure, Norman? I'm pretty sure you want to screw your mother. But, you know, he killed her at least, you know. But, yeah, so it's it's an interesting character dive in the psychology stuff, understanding his character more, and I really like that. Like, I know it can be really cheap and cheesy to go with the obvious, but let's do the prequel stuff. Hell, I, I just got the Hellraiser set in. The fourth one does exactly that. Oh, let's find the origins of the box. Yeah. That's what the fourth movie does. So it's like, sure, when you're out of ideas, you do that. But they did get the guy who wrote the first film back. And uh, that's pretty cool. I like that. So, and they also, they got the score of the original film, which I thought was a little overutilized at first, but then nicely utilized throughout. But I did like the alternate score that a second composer had done. You know, I think clearly this is a, we got to get as much bang for our buck as possible. You know, we've got to have the mother character, we've got to have the iconic dress and the look, we've got to have the music, we've got to remind people about Marion Crane, stuff like that. They don't really emphasize that, like they don't show any footage of her or whatever, so no footage from previous films, which I like. But yeah, so the third, the final act is basically just a, you see his mother die and how overdrawn it is, whatever the crap. And then of course it's him meeting up with his wife at mother's house, and he wants to kill her or whatever, so that becomes a confrontation of its own and has a happy resolution. Or is it? it? It basically is. For once, they actually have more of a happy resolution to it, and I won't say exactly what happens, but it's. I think it works really nice. I think it works. It's touching. It's, it's kind of funny how, like, the extra stuff, like the, the mother's still there, all that kind of stuff, it cuts to black and you get a certain sound effect, and you're like, oh, okay, I see where they're going. So clearly they could have gone with a fifth one, they didn't. But I still think for a four-part series, uh, I think this really works. I really I really enjoyed the fourth film. I think it... <sighs> I've, it's my third favourite. Like, if I'm going to think of a current ranking, it would be two, one, four, three. But... Uh, I don't know. I think if the second... If the, third, if the fourth one had a better ending... I would have liked it more, but clearly they need to bring back, oh, we're going to make sure he's got a knife and trying to kill people, whatever. Like, if it ain't ending with him as a serial killer to some degree, is it worth it? But it's like, I like how these films take a psychological dive in on the character. It's not about he's murdering people left and right again and again and again and again. You know, it's not Bloody Friday the 13th Part 17. It's Norman Bates, and I really like that. So, yeah, I th yeah. So I think the second one's my favourite. The first one, very close second. If if the second half was a lot more entertaining to watch on rewatch, then yeah. There was apparently, because I watched the whole making of Psycho, and they had mentioned how they had to remove a scene of the sister and the boyfriend, uh, Marion's boyfriend, talking. And it developed more like their sorrow for like how, like, oh, you know, they're both sad that she's dead. And even Hitchcock said, like, sure. We've got to cut the scene, but it's kind of implied anyway because they're both obviously all still looking for her. Sure, maybe it wouldn't have made the scene, the film, as better for me or whatever, even though this was still the uncut version, so you get all the graphic stuff. But yeah, it's just... Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I think I still think the first, the first one's always going to be on top of the third and fourth one anyway because of just masterful directing and all that stuff. It's how iconic it is, all that jazz. But I really like the fourth one. Um, I really wish I liked the third one more, uh, 
but it is what it is. I think I'm, I might have really appreciated, you know, look at my phone during the parts where he's killing other people and just imagine that this hasn't, doesn't happen, whatever. So, I don't know. Again, if you can hear him to go back, you know, it's the thunder. Thunder and lightning. Very, very frightening. But, um, yeah, I, I like this four-part film series. It's a really unique series of films because you'd think they'd just be remaking the same kind of film over and over. Uh, but they didn't. And I really like what they did. I think Anthony Perkins was terrific in it. I think each film covers its own basis and story and none of them feels familiar to the previous or what comes after. And I like how they all feel very individual. Even part two and part three are a good double part. Like you, you could watch them back to back and get the same appreciation. Whereas like one and four you could watch separately. So yeah, I don't know. I like that about it. There's, there's, there's good ways that you can watch them. It's very entertaining. You can't really go from the first one and skip the second and third and go to the fourth one. You probably could. He does reference what happens briefly in the second and third film because, again, it takes place over like a two, three week period. So, in theory, you could jump straight to the fourth one after the first one and not exactly miss anything because it's like, oh, yeah, he, he went to the, he was in the psych ward, he got out, he killed a few more people and then went back into the psych ward. It's like, okay, that's an easily explanation for the second and third film. And then you can still watch the fourth one, get his backstory and all that, and a conclusion. But I feel like it's a lot more earned if you watch the second and third one for the development and whatnot. So, yeah. Hey, yeah, well, we're back for the rest of the part. We're talking about Psycho 1998, directed by Gus Van Sant. I believe he... He didn't actually write it, it was written by Joseph Stefano, interesting. I didn't do too much of the diving into the backstory, into the history of the making of this film, but I did watch it, I did get this Scream Factory release, which is uh, not bad, it does come with an audio commentary, as well as um, a making of, and another audio commentary, so there's that. But it's an interesting flick. I gave it three stars, it's out of five of course. It's one of those things where I'm watching it and I'm just like, yeah, I don't care that much for it. It's an okay film. It still works. If you haven't seen the original, this is, well, I mean, you know, sub, this is a good sub, uh, what do you, what, what's that? I was going to say submission. It's a, it's a good alternative, theoretically. I can't really say it's the best movie I've ever seen. It's definitely it's not the best psycho film either. It's an interesting one. Because, obviously, if you know what this film is, it is a basically shot-for-shot -shot remake of the original. That's kind of the point. Van Sant wanted to make an experimental film where he just got a bunch of... Well, I'd say big name, but I don't know how big they were at the time. Like Vince Vaughn, Julianne Moore. I don't even know who plays Marion Crane. Um, I've never... I don't think I've seen her in much before. Anne Hetch. Uh, you've got William H. Macy. You've got Viggo Mortensen. There's a lot of people, a lot of faces that I recognise. Basically, every character who was in the lead, I actually recognise as someone, you know? Um, and that's great. You know, it still has good production design. The only thing that really looks different outside of the time period and slight location changes is the main Bates Motel house, I imagine, because they burnt it down during the fourth one. It's obviously not going to be the same one in this one. <laughs> There's no continuity between the two. It's just I think that might be what happened. I don't know. I'm pretty sure they still have that original house. They just wanted to do something different. I probably should have watched the making of. But at least from an impression stake knowing that this was meant to be a experiment of whether you should or should not do a shot for shot remake of a certified masterpiece um yeah it kind of proves its point that you shouldn't do that it, it it's a uh, see i feel like if the film stuck to its vision of doing this straight remake despite it being boring as shit at least would have still delivered the idea across of don't do a straight remake, it's a bad idea. But it's also like, uh, common sense exists. Like, in the past 25 years, we've had a lot of remakes of classic cinema, of great films, of classic horror, classic dramas, classic mysteries, all kinds of stuff. And you get the idea that, you're like, yeah, unless you're doing something different or adding to it, there's no real flavour in it. Like, even right now, today, as I'm filming that I've watched this, I have watched the new Scott Pilgrim show on Netflix, and even that is a 
I thought it was going to be a straight adaptation of the comics. It isn't. It does in the first episode. It's a bit of the movie, a bit of the comics, and then it goes on a completely different direction. And I like that about it. You know, so each medium is something different. The movie, the comics, and the, the anime. You know, they're all something different. And I think what Psycho 98 should have done, actually one of the guys who I follow on Letterboxd, I actually liked his review of it. He gave it less favourable star-wise, but I still thought it was all right. It was Matt Singer's review where he specifically said how the missed opportunity of this film should have been how the first 40 minutes, you know, with Janet Lee should have still been the same, but then when you got to the iconic shower scene, which is iconic not because she dies or not because it's violent, but because it narratively changes the direction of the film completely by literally killing off the protagonist, that's where this film should have done the opposite. Instead of killing off the protagonist, it should have done something else. He suggested it be more like a slasher film where he's trying to chase her, she's trying to run away, and it becomes a cat and mouse for the rest of the film, whatever. It's not about the side characters, it's not about the boyfriend and the sister and the, and the detective. Maybe they're involved, it doesn't matter. But it's, it's that idea of doing something that would shock the audience of 1998, not by remaking the same thing shot for shot, but by remaking it shot for shot and then changing it at the moment that you know is the most iconic, have all the posters, have all the teasers be, hey, we're going to kill Janet Lee again in the shower, except this time you're going to see the blood, you know? Except you don't do that, you know? But unfortunately they did. So for me, I did say that there were some interesting parts of it. Um, because this isn't 100% shot for shot. I'd say it's maybe 95, 98%. Because they do some extra stuff in it. There's the peeping Tom shot where he, Vince Vaughn, as you know, Norman Bates, is looking through the little peeping hole at, you know, at her changing. And you can hear him jacking off. And he even pulls up his pants. Like, you don't see him do it, but you can hear him doing it. Like, you can see him moving and stuff. So there's an obvious um, textual analysis of, yeah, he's just doing that. Like, there's no, oh, he's getting a creepy eye fall and he's going to beat off later. It's no, you can hear him doing it. Which is an interesting change. Um, that would have been something that's not too dramatic of a difference, but I'm like, but a lot more... Uh, blatant for 1998 audiences at least a lot more holy shit he's actually doing that that was a bit of a shock I will be honest um because I'm just like is he is he doing what I think he's doing and I'm like oh he's doing what I think he's doing and then they have two extra parts when William H Macy's character the detective the PI uh dies you know he's the guy that falls down the stairs they intercut it with two different shots which I don't really know why that is. I need to probably, I definitely need to look into it. I actually filmed it on my phone because I was very confused by it. It cuts to, it intercuts to a shot of a girl who's got a blindfold on and who's got underpants on. And then to what looks like a goat and or a baby cow on a road, a rainy road. And... Then he screams and falls down, and there's a weird blurring effect, as you can see, Norma. I, I think the idea is that to disguise the fact that it's actually still Norman Bates dressed up as his mother. So everything else is the same, except for, of course, when um, Lila, the sister, discovers Norma, the dead Norma, in the basement. It's She's sitting in front of a cage of birds which is interesting, and I'm like, oh, that's an interesting thing, like, it's an actual cage of birds, there are all these different birds, kind of showing that Norman probably treats them and cares for them and then kills them, and that could be an interesting commentary element, but then, you know, of course, it's still this reveal, oh, look, it's Norma's corpse, and she hits the light, and it goes flying by, and there's a great strobing sound, which was really interesting, I like that, but then it just, like, cuts the shot to you know, Norman Bates, so Vince Vaughn is Norman Bates, it's just him in a blonde wig. Like, it's not him in a grandma wig or an old lady wig, it's just him in a blonde wig with, like, a silk nighty. Like, I know it's meant to look more appropriate for the 90s, but it's also, like, I mean, was his mother, like, 30 when she died? Like, when he killed her? Like, was that, is that the whole shtick? I'm pretty sure it is the whole shtick. 
because it's like it makes more sense for that than for her to have been elderly, you know, because, I mean, they you always look at her in the original films and it's like, I mean, I think she's meant to look elderly in the original films, but I think it's mother as a personality is meant to be elderly, though she never was. I mean, even the fourth one clarifies that she died in, like, her mid-30s or 40s or something, so it's like, she wasn't exactly an old lady. She just had wigs. Yeah, it's it's a weird one. I don't know. There's There's those extra touches that it makes me feel like Especially because most of them are editing touches, uh, except for, of course, the jacking off part. That's the only part that I'm like, you could have kept the exact same film as the original and added that, and it would have added a bit more creepiness to it. But the problem with the film is the fact that it doesn't do anything else. It, it, it feels like with those extra touches that it actually just wants to do something different. It wants to do something unique. The end credits theme is like a mishmash of the main themes throughout the film that are from the original film, but like remixed into this really creepy, like eerie way. And I really like that, but it's credited as an actual song. So clearly someone just made a song for the film. There's a Rob Zombie song in the film, apparently. At least it was credited in the end credits, but I'm not as familiar with his music, so I didn't pick it up. So it's just, it's just one of those things where you watch the film and you're like, this is exactly the same as the original, just in colour with different actors. And it feels like it as well. Like, it doesn't have the energy of the original, because the original feels like a film. This one feels like, I'd say like a theatre production. Like, you know those high school theatre productions that they put on where it's like, it's, it's trying to be the same thing, but also not. You know, they can't completely do the same thing, but you know... It, it feels like a bunch of professional actors cosplaying as these characters, and that's it. Like, they're playing the people playing the characters. They're not playing the characters themselves, because there's no direction to make them feel like different characters. The whole point is that everyone has to feel exactly like they did in the original film, which is how much he's going for shot for shot. He's not just going, it has to look exactly the same, except in colour. He's going... It, they everyone needs to feel like they did in the original film. And that's where I think it's also it has its weakest element. There's no wiggle room to allow the characters to breathe, to be different, to grow. And uh, that's the weakest part. It's literally just taking the exact same script and just running it again. So I think in my review I referenced that, at least in my high school days, in uh, like year 11 chemistry, we had these books that had like... You had the paper and the second line of paper was blue and the idea was you would write on the paper and it would like do a carbon copy through the blue onto like the page after. I don't know how the hell it worked but the idea was that you'd have one copy for yourself, one copy like for the teacher or for like the files or whatever the crap so you could do your experiments and whatever because it was chemistry class. Maybe it was biology but it was one of those science classes and it's one of those things of that's what it feels like. It feels like someone's written the work for him and he's just taken the, like, the copied version and claims that it's his own, even though it's the exact same thing as someone else's. Maybe he's changed his name, of course, and a little bit of, you know, sprucing up a bit, but not even sprucing, just a bit of, just a bit of flavour, but not even, just different characters, different actors, sorry. And then there's extra things. There's extra cutaways. I don't know why he did that. Like... I've only seen a few Gus Van Sant films in my time, that being, like, uh, I have Drugstore Cowboy, but I haven't seen it, but the, um, My Own Private Idaho I've seen before, and I thought it was good, but it's, like, it's one of those films of, it's also just a Shakespeare, you know? Which is a very obvious when you realise half the people talk like Shakespeare. It, it's, it's, you know, it's very there in the text. So, yeah... I wouldn't say it's a misfire of a film. You can love it or hate it, for sure. It's an experiment, for one thing. Like, if you've seen the original, there is basically no reason to watch the remake. Um, me buying it and watching it for my own study, really. I will probably watch the behind-the-scenes doco as well, the making of. Hell, I might even watch the commentary at some stage, because it feels more like it's appropriate to watch the commentary. Um, but yeah, there's just nothing about it that's... Except for those little extra parts that makes it feel like it should be worthy of existing. Like, the point of its experimentation of, hey, we're making this film, it's a commentary on how you shouldn't be making these kind of films. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But the problem is that they stick to that commentary almost wholeheartedly. I, I think, again, it, it irks me that they don't, like that they actually add the extra stuff. And I'm like, the extra stuff is interesting. I was just like, oh my god, something new, something different. 
And I'm like, well, why are you putting that stuff in there if you want to be so hardcore on this is exactly the same as the original? You know, if you can't stick by your own rules, then fuck the rules, you know? And this is art. You know, do something different. Like, I know this isn't the corporate way of remaking a film where they're literally just, oh, we've got the IP, we're going to remake it like, like bloody uh, HBO with their, we're going to do um, a Harry, H- Harry Potter TV show, you know? It's, it's only been 10 years since the movie finished and we're doing it again. Like, something like that, you know? It's like, where it doesn't feel needed, doesn't feel earned yet. There's there's so many remakes and recreations of the thing and stuff like that, you know, like like the 2011 one, of course, where that still does something different at least. It doesn't earn its stay because of the special effects, but it's like, of course, if they had to use the practical, but that's a whole different story. But it's one of those things of like, there are plenty of, especially in the decade prior to this movie coming out, there are plenty of other remakes that makes it, the argument solid that if you have the artistic integrity, don't remake something shot for shot. Like, I don't think anyone had really done that. Obviously, he probably thought, no one's done this, let's try it out. And it's like, yeah, but no. Like, it, it, it should immediately feel like a bad idea. Like, the, the better remakes, I've, t- I've talked about this before with my remake trilogy video, talking about the fly, the thing, and uh, the blob, and how they're 380s remakes that take the original and amplify them 30 years later for a better effects, better story, better everything, basically. And they are incredible films. The originals are classics, and sure, they're still cheesy B-movies from the 50s, but they're classic, they're fun. Hell, one's got Vincent Price in it, you know? You can't really lose there. One's got Steve McQueen, you know? What, who was in the thing from Another World? I don't know, but he's a giant vegetable monster, kind of. It's bizarre, but it's a Howard Hawks film. There you go. So they've all got their qualities, and the new ones add something else to it. You know, you've got different director visions, you've got artistic visions, you've got so much art and creativity going into it. So it's like you look at the thing, and then you look at Psycho, and you're like, why? How is it that you had a classic in the 50s and a classic in the 80s, and then you get a classic in the 60s, and they not very much classic because it's kind of stupid in the 90s? Like, I don't know. Maybe if Gus Van Sant went on the internet and discovered that actually people don't like remakes that much, or they only like remakes when they're different, maybe he would have thought, do something different then. Not, you know take the idea and run with the same script and then change things differently for how actors act or whatever. Because, again, this film really feels stiff by the fact that everyone's kind of in the bubble of they need to do exactly what the other actor did in the previous film. So it just feels like a carbon copy. That's its main problem. Like, you can't, I can't criticise any performance in this movie because it clearly feels like they want to be, or like the, they were directed to look and feel exactly like the characters in the previous version. Like, so I can't, I can't say any problems. I can't say any criticisms against anyone. Like, I could say Vince Vaughn's a terrible actor, but I'm also like, I don't think this is a good justifiable excuse to say that statement because he's trying to be the other guy in the other film as per this other guy's direction, you know? It's it's that. It feels limiting. So, yeah, if they had have taken the original idea, gone with the original 40 minutes, sure, shot for shot remake, do something really interesting, do it all in colour, makes you think you're going to get to the shower scene and she's going to die, and then it completely pulls the rug out and it's a completely different movie. That would have been fun. Even if people hated it, 20 years later, people would have been like, damn, that was insane. I can't believe they did that, you know? Like, Van Sant's commentary would have still applied for the first 40 minutes. This is why you shouldn't remake the original 40, because, of course, when you're watching the original 40 minutes of that goddamn movie, it doesn't have the same tension. Because Gus Van Sant is no Hitchcock. He's, he's not good in the directing chair to make that feel tense, make it feel earned. Oh, my God, is the feeling there in the original Psycho. This makes me really, really, really appreciate the original Psycho. Still hate the second half of the film, but, you know... <laughs> It's just one of those things. But, it, you know, that makes me appreciate so much more from the original film in a way. But, yeah, so I still won't give the, the original film more of a star rating, to be honest, though. I'm still pretty happy where, where it's at, you know. Obviously, it's a film that in lesser hands would have been bad, but that's kind of a lot with a lot of different films. You know, if you have the artistic vision, then yes. But if you don't, then you don't. So, yeah, 
it's an interesting experiment. I wouldn't say it shouldn't have been done. I would just say it should have been done differently. You know? So, yeah. And that's it. What did I think? What did I think? I thought this was an interesting series of films, the Psycho films. Obviously, the first one is still a classic. It's legendary. Perfectly respectable film. And honestly, I still really like it. I love the first 45 minutes, first 50 odd minutes until she dies. I still don't love the rest of it, but Nolan Bates is really good. You know, like Anthony Perkins is terrific. And the sequels are really fun to watch. The third one, not so much, but I still really like the second and fourth one. So it's an interesting series. I kind of feel like I would have preferred that the Arrow video set had have come with the 98 film. I feel like that would have made for a really interesting dichotomy, especially because with some extra, like, not for commentaries, but some extra, extra, like, interviews, like an analysis or something. Um, you know, postmodern analysis or some bullshit. That could have been really interesting. Something like that, what Alexander Helen Nicholas had done for the third film. Was it the third film? Yeah, the third film of Psycho 3. If they had something like that, if they had added the fourth film to the Arrow set and done, done that for Psycho 98, it could have been a really, really perfect set. But in all fairness, still a good set. I would recommend the Arrow video set. I would recommend the Scream Factory release. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't recommend Psycho 98 as a film to buy unless you're a film person like myself, like someone who's really hardcore into it. You know, maybe you still really love the original Psycho and you might still really like this. I know a lot of Psycho fans who really like this film still. So it's it's worth checking out to a degree. I figure i just buy it because, like, why not? Anyway, thanks for watching. Um... Let me know your thoughts down below, and I'll see you in the next one. Uh, bye. Check out more Calm and Relaxed over there, and uh, adios.